We are conducting archaeobotanical investigations in this area. Archaeobotanical investigations are concerned with ancient remains of plants that have been retrieved from archaeological excavations. We work in the vicinity of the excavation and receive soil samples from the archaeologists, which we screen for plant remains. As archaeologists, we are interested in understanding the everyday life of past human populations. And as archaeobotanists, we are, amongst other things, interested in investigating which plant foods people ate. This is especially relevant because food forms an integral part of a survival and thus also of everyday life. Based on our investigations, we, on one hand, are able to suggest which plants were used at an archaeological site, which plants were stored, and which plants were prepared for food. On the other hand, we encounter various species of weeds and wild plants alongside crops, and by investigating their characteristics, we are able to reconstruct the composition of past agricultural plots or fields. We are currently in Mecklenburg, which is an area characterized as a young moraine landscape. The soils here are light and sandy, and as you can see, they have a loose texture. This is an advantage to archaeobotanical analysis, because we do not encounter dense masses of sediment, and the charred plant remains are easily separated from the sand. During the excavations, all activities and finds are documented for future reference. For example, finds and samples are documented in lists and are given systematic numbers that enable us to allocate the finds and samples to the excavated area later on. This is then used in the archaeological interpretation of the site. On each excavation, every find and sample receives a label containing the respective metadata. It is important to ensure that the labels are water resistant. They are therefore printed on waterproof paper and written on using a pencil. The pencil is a crucial tool at archaeological excavations because it is the most durable and water resistant pen that exists and it will thus ensure that none of the information gets lost. The label is put inside a small plastic bag and is subsequently placed on top of the soil sample in a bucket which is closed with a lid. The bucket itself is also labeled from the outside to ensure that the metadata are transferred correctly. It is thereby important to label the bucket itself and not the lid, because the bucket is physically related to the sample, while the lid can get lost, or even worse, become exchanged with another lid. So as a double safety measure, the sample number is recorded both on the sample label as well as on the sample bucket. We receive the samples in 10 liter buckets, which is a volume that has proved to be representative for most archaeological features. We are now arriving at the flotation area that is located in close proximity to the archaeological excavation on an abandoned peat cutting site. In Dobin, we make use of the bucket flotation method. Our flotation system consists of simple utensils, including a garden hose, a 12-liter mason bucket, a rope, and most importantly, a bilge pump that can pump approximately 20 liters water per minute and can be connected to a 12-volt car battery using crocodile clips. In order to secure the supply of electricity, the car battery is in turn connected to a 135 watt solar panel. During the construction of the flotation system, the garden hose is connected to the bilge pump. The pump is covered by a fine gauze in order to avoid contamination with material from the water. The pump is secured to the mason bucket using the rope. The bucket is filled with a small amount of water and subsequently sunk into the water. Even when the water is shallow, the pump is able to supply the flotation system with enough water. Luckily, the car battery supplying the pump with water is not noisy. The soil samples from the excavation are delivered directly to the flotation area.
Each sample is documented by copying the metadata from the find label onto a list containing all soil samples that have been floated. The find label is stored inside a sample bag and the label used to mark the sample bucket is transferred to one of the flotation buckets. The soil sample is subsequently distributed between several flotation buckets. We generally pour approximately two liter of sediment into each bucket and then add water to fill it up. The flotation area itself consists of two parts. We use a plastic crate with a mesh bottom and place a sieve with a 0.3 mm mesh size on top. The sieve is secured using two pins, which ensures that it cannot slide into the water and take our valuable sample with it. There is of course also a comfortable chair to sit on. The sediment in the flotation buckets is shortly soaked in the water and subsequently floated. Flotation is a method that is suitable for the retrieval of charred plant remains, which is what we are expecting at the settlement of Dobin. The method itself derives from techniques of gold washing, which relies on difference in density between the water and the components within the sediment. Without applying pressure, the sediment is carefully stirred. Due to the stirring motion, it becomes mixed with the water and the charred remains float to the surface, enabling us to pour the water with the charred remains onto the sieve. We use a sieve with a small mesh size of 0.3 mm in order to ensure that we recover even the smallest remains of weeds and wild plants. The procedure of floating and washing is repeated at least three times per 10 liter sample. It is important to stop pouring the water on time to prevent stones and other components of the sediment to fall onto the sieve. So we really retrieve the smallest plant remains as well. The residue that is caught in the sieve generally contains fine fragments of plant roots. These originate from the topsoil and are separated from the sample during a later stage. We secure the saving residue by placing it in a plastic bag, which also contains the original label, and we pour a bit of water into it to prevent that it dries out. I swiftly turn the sieve around in the bag and beat it against the edge of the crate so that the residue falls into the bag. Then I add a bit of water on top. The sieve and the bucket are cleaned thoroughly after every 10 liter sample has been floated. In some cases, charred plant remains are not able to float. This is generally caused by incrustations on the charred remains that are related to the type of sediment at the archaeological site. Fine silt accumulates on the plant remains, which results in the remains being too heavy to float to the surface. After flotation, the sediment is therefore screened using a sieve with a 2 mm mesh size, and we thereby look out for charred remains as well as other finds that could be of interest to the archaeologists. Examples of such finds are small bones from fireplaces and fragments of amber beads that are difficult to detect during excavations themselves due to their small size, but are more easily detected during flotation and screening.
The flotation residue of the samples is washed again in the lab subsequent to the excavations, whereby we also use a sieve with a 0.3 mm mesh size. The excavations at Dobin were conducted in an area where plant remains can only be preserved in a charred or mineralized state. We dry these remains after the second round of washing at the lab using newspaper sheets. For this purpose, we document the sample number on the sheet using a pencil and place the sample label inside the sheet. As soon as clear water starts running out of the sieve, the residue is ready for drying. The residue is beaten out of the sieve onto the sheet of newspaper and the sheet is subsequently placed inside a drying cabinet. After two to three days, the samples are usually dry enough to be transferred into paper sandwich bags. Paper bags are especially suitable for storing such remains because they allow the remaining moisture to escape from the samples. The metadata of the samples are documented on the paper bags using a pencil and the sample labels are secured to the outside of the bags. Now the samples are ready to be sorted and identified using a binocular with a magnification between 10 to 40 times.